In the deep south of the 1950s and 60s, there were two enduring traditions, the excitement and spectacle of college football and the grim reality of racial discrimination. In Southern college football, all major schools had one thing in common. Every football player, coach, and cheerleader was white. One college president and one athlete in the Deep South broke through this barrier and compromised the region's racist beliefs. The president, Dr. Henry King Stanford. The athlete who made history, Ray Bellamy. In the 40s and 50s, integration had begun at Northern and Western schools, with Ernie Davis of Syracuse winning the Heisman Trophy in 1961. But in the Deep South, times had not changed. Civil rights workers were attacked with water hoses and police dogs, and then arrested. Discrimination was so ingrained that ticket sales for this game, involving Florida A&M University, a historically black college, were sold to whites only. Black patrons had to request seats by mail. Civil rights leaders stepped up their calls for integration. We can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by signs stating for whites only. In this climate of racial conflict, integration was slow to arrive at Southern colleges and universities. How long is it going to be before a Negro walking on a campus at the University of Mississippi will attract no attention? Well, I, uh, you could say that it, it may be a generation. Even as integration slowly spread at colleges in the Deep South, many athletic teams still resisted the movement, fearing retaliation by fans. On one occasion, the University of Miami actually canceled a football game against UCLA rather than face an integrated team. The University of Miami had refused to play against Jackie Robinson. Andy Gustafson was Miami's head coach from 1948 to 1963 and would not recruit black players. But with the arrival of Dr. Henry King Stanford as University of Miami president in 1962, things began to change. Today from his bed in a Georgia nursing home, Dr. Stanford recalls confronting his football coach over integration. And the Gustafson said, Dr. Stanford, you don't understand, if we recruit a black football player, LSU will cancel a contract. Well, we'll cancel our game. I said, who in the hell is making policy of the University of Miami, me or LSU? Dr. Stanford's motivation for integrating his football team came from his experience seeing racial hatred up close as a young man. One of the things that brought me over is was studying in Nazi Germany when I was 20 years old. Some of the white Americans from the North thought it was terrible the way, and I did too, the way the Nazis were treating the Jews. I remember how we were treating blacks in the South at the same time. Additionally, the social environment at the University of Miami also favored integration. At least 50% of our student body in 1966 through the early 1970s came from the Northeast Corridor. The Miami area you know, has so many people from the Northeast and the Midwest, it's probably a little more open to a lot of things, just like it was a little more open to uh, Cassius Clay, who became Muhammad Ali. In 1966, Dr. Stanford and new head coach Charlie Tate made a decision. They sent a recruiter to the west coast of Florida to scout a black athlete who had the skills to play football and the mental strength to endure the discrimination he would face. There, Miami found Ray Bellamy, an academically excelling student who after school picked tomatoes to support his family. My family didn't have monies to fly me from California. If I would've gone to California, I probably never would've seen my family, but maybe once a year. So it was the right thing to do now that I look at it in retrospect. In December of 1966, Bellamy was signed to become the first black scholarship football athlete in the Deep South. What are your feelings after being on the Miami campus for about three days? Well, I just love it. I mean, I really enjoy it. All the guys treat me real nice. And, uh, 
I mean, I'm kind of happy that I made the decision mm -hmm. to come to the university. Even though I am the first Negro, uh, I have no discrimination at all. All the guys, are, they treat me real nice. I'm going to give it to you bottom line, okay? And I'm not pulling any punches on this. All anybody want to know is if the guy could play ball. Didn't make a bit of difference to us. Still, racial tensions followed Bellamy to Miami. He got into a cafeteria fight with the team's starting quarterback, David Olivo, and received hate mail from local citizens. Do you know what hell is? We will make your next four years at the University of Miami hell. In his career, Bellamy was often the only African-American football player on the field. When he traveled to Gainesville to play an all-white University of Florida team, Bellamy used that as motivation. It was exciting. It was exciting because they had said that couldn't no blacks play for them. And obviously, um, that was went heavy on my heart. It hurt me uh, for someone to say those kind of things about the black athlete, because I was a black athlete. So whenever I played against them, I saved my best for them. However, the process of integration was tragic at other colleges. One day in 1967 at the University of Kentucky, Greg Page was tackled by the entire defensive squad of his own team during practice. He died in the hospital 38 days later. Florida State University recruited Calvin Patterson in 1968, two years after Ray Bellamy. As he played, he slowly became depressed and skipped classes because of hate mail and discrimination. During his senior year in 1972, he committed suicide. Eventually he ended up um, putting a shotgun in his mouth and killed himself, you know, so I, 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 that saddened me because I don't know how to explain that. I, I still hurt. As riots gripped Miami and other cities in 1968, Ray Bellamy became a star player, catching 37 passes as a sophomore. But after that season, Bellamy was severely injured in a near-fatal car crash, effectively ending his football career. However, even off the field, Ray Bellamy broke racial barriers. In 1971, he was elected by his peers to be the university's first black student government president. Under Dr. Sanford's leadership, Miami continued to recruit more African Americans. It really took um, an extraordinary effort by Dr. Stanford to explain to the community uh, why he was doing what he was doing, and Ray Bellamy was you know, he changed history. As the first African-American student athlete at the University of Miami, Bellamy was also the university's first African-American student body president. Ladies and gentlemen, Ray After Dr. Stanford's efforts to integrate Miami's college football program, other institutions in the Deep South followed. Slowly, year by year, integration spread throughout the college football teams of the Deep South. The final school to integrate was LSU in 1972. Miami's signing of Ray Bellamy in 1966 did not by itself erase decades of segregation. However, it marks the beginning of college football integration in the Deep South. Dr. Stanford's bold, progressive actions demonstrated to other college presidents, coaches, and fans that integration could be achieved. But today, there is still conflict over racial integration in college football. Out of 119 major college football schools, only six have African American head coaches. To solve today's challenges, it will take people with the courage and commitment exhibited by Dr. Stanford during the 1960s. Together with Ray Bellamy and the other pioneers of that era, they confronted conflict and compromised attitudes that denied opportunity to thousands of Americans. We white Southerners finally came around to the conclusion that we've been doing things wrong for decades after decades. And uh, Ray was one of those who helped me break the tradition in universities.